Let me go ahead and say something at the outset of this message. I'm going to chap about 5% of you this morning. The rest of you are going to enjoy it, but you're not going to get much out of the message. I've been studying the life of Adam in the Old Testament. And I've been looking at him, I've been processing him, and I was going to preach this morning a message on how to be a man of God at home. The more I got to studying it, I was going to then start next Sunday, I was going to talk about Eve and how to be a woman of God at home. But the more I got to studying this, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's going to take me a few services to preach this one message. But I'm just going to go ahead and chap a few of you this morning, but that will be all right. I took a big dose this morning. I don't give a rip. And so you love me and I'll love you. But it's amazing to me how far off culture has gotten from the Word of God. It's an amazing thing to me. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden that thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Bible says, is very clear that Genesis is the beginning of all things. The old preachers called it the seed plot of the Bible. For in the book of Genesis, you'll see every tree that springs up from every other book, somewhere inside of the book of Genesis, that seed is laid down in that book. We find in the book of Genesis, we see the one picture of a perfect man. Now, I'm talking outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, a man that was all flesh, no God, just all flesh. Adam was the only picture of a perfect man that we get, and it's a small picture. It's a short glimpse of Brother Adam. We see this man, and in 49 Hebrew words, that's all we have of Adam's perfect life in the Garden of Eden. 49 words is all we see. But I'm finding God knows how to load the wheelbarrow full of stuff in 49 short little words. Because in this seed plot, in the life of Adam, you're going to see a perfect man that loved God with a perfect fullness. Now here is what's interesting to me as I studied this. Now I'm fixing to chap a whole lot of brothers in this room right now that will be just fine. But do you realize when you look at Adam's life, the very first thing God did to Adam when he created him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, before God gave Adam a name, you know what he gave him? A job. You look back at that and it says in verse 15, the Lord God took the what? Not Adam, he took the what? He took the man. And before God gave Adam an identity, He gave him a job. It's an interesting correlation that we find in the Bible between men and working. You will never find God do anything with anybody before or after if they do not have a work ethic and work. Think about it. When God found Moses, he was working as a shepherd. When God found David, he was working as a shepherd. When Elijah found Elisha, he was working as a farmer. Before that Jesus was raised up in his ministry, he was working as a carpenter. When Jesus found the disciples, they were working as fishermen. When Paul found Aquila and Priscilla, it was because of their mutual work as tent makers. It is the very root nature of a male species, of a male creature of the male human to want to work and accomplish something. It is the very root nature when God births a man inside of his mother's womb and he puts in him the chromosome that makes him a male. Inside of that chromosome, he puts the very innate desire to work 
and to labor and accomplish something for his culture, for his family. Now I'm going to tell you, here's what's happening right now. We have so beat down males in this culture. We have so welfareized society. We've told people, it doesn't matter if you work. We've told these men, if you win, if you lose, you get a trophy. It doesn't matter if you labor hard, work hard, work low. We'll give you the same prize anyway. And here's what we've done. Layer by layer, we've ripped away the masculinity right out of men. And we can't figure out why our men have no authority. We can't figure out why our men have no work ethic. And we can't figure out why our men at alarming rates are taking their lives with suicide. I'll tell you why. Because when you tell a man that the very root nature of what he has pumping inside of him, that he wants to work and do something and make something of himself and do something for the God that created him, and you tell him, no, it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to get the same thing. Going to make the same money. Going to get the same prize. Going to get the same trophy. You don't have to work as hard as that guy. It doesn't matter. He begins to question everything from the beginning to the end and so here's what they end up doing they say well I don't have to work mama give me everything daddy give me everything I don't have to work government give me everything I don't have to work church helps me with everything I don't have to do anything I can stay at home and we can't figure out why they get carpal tunnel of the thumbs before they have back problems you know why because they figure I can accomplish more with my thumbs on a computer than I can with my back in labor and we have so ripped from these men I can already tell some of you getting chapped from your high to your top. It don't bother me because I'm going to tell you something. If you will teach a man that it is important to labor and it is important to work, you will reinstill back in him the very root nature of what God put in that man and that is to work. Now here's what I'm showing you. Before man sinned, before man was married, before man had a name, God said, I've got something I want you to do. I've got a job I want you to perform. And if you'll do this, you'll find fulfillment, you'll find satisfaction, you'll find something inside. Ladies and gentlemen, we have so juvenilized society. It is amazing to me. The winners are the losers. The right is the wrong. The up is the down. The good is the bad. The male is the female. The boy is the girl. And we can't figure out why in God's name they're spinning around and they have no idea what's coming. They have no idea what's going. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. Lord God, we have to pass rules so people know what bathroom to go. I'm telling you, It's the society that's flipped everything upside down. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you men, every single one of you that are saved by the grace of God, you are a son of God. And if you are a son of God, he expects his sons to act like men of God. Men of God, that's not a name that God labels for his preachers. That is a name that God labels for every male that represents him somewhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you that every male in here that has a male mind, has a male anatomy, and has a male physiology inside of him, he has been made a man of God by the God that saved me and the God that called me. He put that same thing in every male in here. But I got an idea. Let's rip everything away that's right and let's see if we can get this thing to work right. And you know what we've raised? We've raised men that have adult anatomies but children's psychologies. I think it's a good idea. Let's not make Bubba work. Bubba's 45. He's still learning. First of all, I ain't never met a Bubba at 45 that didn't work. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, if we follow this... Let me, let me chat somebody else right quick. We have so scared men to death from being gentlemen, afraid they'll be called chauvinist. You got men, I won't hold a door for a woman because I'm afraid she'll say, you don't think I can do that? Feminism has destroyed femininity. Listen, you know me. I'm not a hobby horse preacher. I preach the book. I find it. I preach it. You and I both know that our culture has destroyed our mindsets. And it's fine. The culture is going to be crazy. Sinners are going to sin. I'm worried about this mess creeping into the house of God and getting in the church of Jesus Christ. And the people of God, they're acting like a bunch of 
absolutely psychotic creatures and we don't know what's up and down. Well, maybe, well, well, maybe, well, maybe nothing. Right is right, wrong is wrong, up is down, up is up and down is down. It's as simple as that. Now here's what I want to show you something. Here's what I want you men to know. I want you men to say this with me. I am a son of God. Therefore, I must be a man of God. Say it again. I am a son of God. Say it. I am a son of God. Therefore, I must be a man of God. Say it like a man. I am a son of God. Therefore, I must be a man of God. And it will start at work. It is not this way for women. It's, it doesn't work like this. That's not the way the daughters of Eve are made. But it is the way the sons of Adam are made. Number one, let me show you how Adam worked. And every single male in this room has been given a calling by God at his job. Number one, I'm going to show you how that God directed Adam's job. Let me show you something in verse number 15. Notice what the Bible says. And God took the man and put him in the garden. Now here's an interesting little picture. I'd never seen this. I'd never thought about this. I'd never processed this. But notice what it says about Adam. The Bible says that God took the man and he placed him in the garden. God did not create Adam in the garden of Eden. It was created somewhere outside of the bounds of the garden. But one day when God created that man, he picked him up and he put him in the place of blessing. That's a picture of what Jesus Jesus Christ did for you and I at salvation. He took an old dirty lump of clay. He molded him into the image of Christ. Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life through the power of the Holy Ghost. And he took him into the place of blessing. May I just say that I am thankful that I was an old dirty rot lump of clay. And the Holy Ghost found me in my muck and mire of sin. Took me, fashioned me in the form of Christ Jesus. Breathed into my nostrils the breath of spiritual life and put me in the place of blessing. But here is the closer picture. Where did Adam get his job? Who did it come from? You know, men today are so unhappy with their jobs. They don't want to get up and go to work. They don't want to get leave work because they don't know if they're going to have a job the next day. They're so unhappy. Has it ever stopped? Has anybody ever stopped to process? You know, maybe I ought to pray about where I work. Not one time have we ever taught our sons, boys, before you get a job, you need to pray about it. Before you go work somewhere, you need to pray about it. Before you accept a position, you need to pray about it. You say you don't need to pray about stuff like that. Why don't you mind your business and I'll mind God's business and I'm telling you we're wrecking society because we're just saying take the best thing that comes your way. How do you know it's the best thing? Pays the most money? Well, that'll help society. That'll help your home. Let them make a lot of money. They'll turn into greedy thieves. They've got the best benefits. They'll turn into fat cats. What happened to us saying, God, open every door and shut every door. You won't open and shut. You say, what are you going to teach your son? I'm going to teach my son this. I'm going to say, now son, you say you want to get a job. You want to do something. You want to make something of yourself. We're going to get on our knees and we're going to say, my God, I'm asking you to direct my boy's path. I'm asking you to open up my boy's doors. I'm asking you to help my son make the right decision. You say he's got a job with benefits, yeah, but there may be demons at that job and they may introduce my boy to liquor. They may introduce my boy to drugs. They may introduce my boy to illicit lifestyles and I hadn't worked myself to death keeping my boy away from liquor, keeping my boy away from drugs, and keeping my boy out of the illicit lifestyles of this world to go and have some fool whose daddy didn't pray with him have my boy wrecked in a week. I'm telling you right now, moms and dads, we better start telling our kids to stop looking at their resume and get on their face and say, God, direct my path. You know how Adam got in the garden? God opened the door. Do you know how you will get the job God wants you to have? If you'll take 30 seconds and pray about it before you do it, you'd be amazed at what will happen. The Bible says, And God took the man and put him in the garden. 
You say, I want to be a firefighter. Ask God to open up the door to the right fire department. You say, I want to be a hair cutter. Ask God to open up the door to the right beauty school. You say, I want to make money on stocks. Praise God. Ask God to give you a computer that won't give you a carpal tunnel. Whatever it is that you desire in your heart, we better start praying about stuff. Let me just say this, fellas. You young men, how many of you guys are 30 and under? 30 and under. Raise your hand. 30 and under. 30 and under. 30 and under. Let me encourage you about something. Before you buy a car, you pray about it. Before you get a credit card, you better pray about it about it. Before you marry somebody, good God, you better start praying about it. Before you take a position, you better pray about it. Before you buy a house, you better pray about it. I don't care if it's the best deal that's ever come. You do know that deals can be duds and the only person that can see it is the booger trying to sell it to you and the God that saved you. Bring everything to God and seek the face of God in everything. What are we doing? We've lost our ever-loving minds. We'll keep the spiritual spiritual and we'll let the physical be physical. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what took Adam and Eve out of the garden of God. Men, I want to encourage you. Seek the face of God Almighty. Before you get a job. You say, I'm only 13. Pray God opens up a good job. You say, I'm 25. I've started a career. Then you better start praying, God help me change or keep me in this. Do your will. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam's job was directed by God. Number two, Adam's job was dedicated to God. I want you to notice two words in this this chapter. Number two, notice what it says. The Bible says, and God put him in the Garden of Eden. Watch this next phrase. To dress it. To dress it. Do you know what that word dress is? That word dress in the Hebrew, it's the word adar. And the word adar, A-D-A-R, the word adar in the Old Testament is always translated to worship a deity. Huh? What do you mean, God? You put me in this garden to worship it. That's not what it says. God says, I didn't put you in the garden to worship it. I put you in the garden to worship in it. Can I ask you a question? Fellas, have you ever stopped for one second to think God put you where He put you for you to be light in that place and for you to hold a worship service wherever it is you work? Ladies and gentlemen, if the church is confined to these four walls, can I remind you the church will not be very big and the church will not be very bright. But if I got 200 men in this room that get up out of here and say, I don't care, bless cuss, if I go to my dump truck tomorrow and it's just me, and the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be the brightest dump truck that rides down the road. If it's just me at a barbering chair, I'll have a Holy Ghost service at the barbering chair. If it's just me and I'm plumbing pipes, it'll be me, God, and the plumbing pipes. If I'm an electrician, it's not going to be the lights that are the only thing bright in my house. It's going to be me and the big three as we worship. Ladies and gentlemen, God's given you the job He's given you for you to hold a worship service everywhere you go. Now, let's not get crazy. Now, preacher, we can't get crazy about this thing, can we? How can I, that have a secular job, worship God? If I hold a worship service with hymns and an offering, I'm going to be the only one giving, and I'm going to get fired, and I ain't going to have nothing to give. How then can you worship God at a secular job. A couple little ways. Number one, you've got to realize that when you do a good job, whatever you're doing, you are showing the beauty of the gospel. Titus chapter 2, verse number 9 and verse number 10. Look at what Titus 2, verse 9 and 10 say. It says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. 
and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God in all things. Do you know what it means to adorn that Greek word adorn? It means cosmeo. It, we get our word cosmetics from it. Ladies, every morning when you get up and you cosmeo, what you do, you do not change... <laughs> You shouldn't change the appearance. What you're doing is you're beautifying. You're bringing it out. You're embellishing. And here is what Paul is saying. He's saying to every slave. He's saying to every servant. Now these people, they didn't get to pick their job. These people didn't get to choose what they were doing. They were sold into slavery. And he told those slaves, he said, boys, he said, wherever you're at, you are adorning the making the doctrine of God beautiful. If they're asking you to make bread, you make the best loaf of bread. That's ever been made and every loaf of bread you make that's good he said here's what you're doing you're showing how beautiful the gospel really is if they've got you out there nailing nails you're showing how beautiful the gospel is if you're in there and you're driving a tractor you're showing how beautiful the gospel is when you do a good job if you're washing cars if you're plumbing pipes if you're cutting I don't care what it is you're doing you're showing how beautiful the gospel is you say how is that preacher man I'll tell you how it was because here you've got these slaves and they're shackled and they're chained and they're in there and they're working and they're laboring and they're whistling away and they're thankful and they're excited and those people come by and say what are you doing old slave man how can you be happy that you are chained and whistling how can you be happy that you've got no hope and you're whistling how can it be that you're looking down yet you're looking up and that old slave said this he said boys can I tell you why I do a good job because this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And every time you do a good job, you remind the world that where you are is not your end result. We've made too many people. Fellas, can I tell you something? You want me to tell you what happens to doctors? Huh? They die. Either the coronavirus, the flu, or a heart attack is going to get them. They're going down. You know what happens to a man who drives a trash truck? He's going to die. I don't know what to tell you. Doctors die. Trash truck guys die. Preachers die. Firemen die. They all die. Do not define yourself by your career. We walk up to people. It's the first thing we ask them. What do you do? You know what I'm going to start saying? I do Jesus. What's your career? Jesus. Because the definition of my soul is not found in anything that's on this earth. The definition of my soul is where my name is written down in another country. Therefore, I'm going to do a good job down here because I know it reflects what's going on up there. Number two. You realize you show the beauty of the gospel, but number two, you do realize you are the glove of Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. We've studied and memorized this verse. The apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Watch this next phrase. Yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. Therefore, if I'm saved, these are my hands, but... These are not my hands. Whose hands are these? They belong to Christ. So therefore, if I cut hair, can you imagine me cutting hair? You ever see that movie, Edward Scissorhands? That'd be what I'd do. Therefore, if you cut hair, you do realize that when you are cutting hair, it's not actually your hands that are doing it. It's the hands of Christ. And when we don't do the best job It's not my hands that get the shame. It's the hands of Christ that get the shame. Fellas, you trade stock. You drive tractors. You own this. You do that. I don't care what it is. Whatever you do, you are the reflection of Christ somewhere. Now, I want to tell you a little story if I can. You do realize this third little place. How do you glorify God at a secular job? Because at every single job, I can glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 
I don't care about a lot in life, but I'm getting old and fat. You know what I am starting to care about? My feet. It's amazing to me. People buy expensive clothes but cheap shoes. I started flipping that. I started buying my shirts at Walmart, in Henley shirts, $7, and I started buying nice shoes. Because if my feet feel good, everything feels good. But I have looked good before, and my feet hurt. I thought I'd die. You know what I would love to learn how to do? I'd love to learn one day how to be a cobbler. Not Stamey's cobbler, boys. The cobbling of shoes. <laughs> Boy right there just licked his lips. <laughs> I heard a story. G. Campbell Morgan told a story one time of an old believer who was a shoe cobbler. Aged man. Walked with God many years. And he had a young apprentice that came in And this young apprentice noticed that every single shoe, whether it was a poor man's shoe or a rich man's shoe, he would meticulously work that shoe. And the work just backed up and backed up and backed up. And the young apprentice looked at the old man and he said, Sir, he said, the work is backing up. Could you please move quicker? And the old man just kept on sewing. Slowly. He finished that shoe. He'd do the next slowly. The young apprentice said, Sir, would you please tell me why you take so much time on the poor man's shoe and the rich man's shoe, the white man's shoe, the black man's shoe, the the good shoe. Why do you take so much time on each one? He said, Oh, son. He said, I have learned that I shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And he said, I know that my God will dump out in front of me beside my crowns every shoe that I ever put my hand on. And the Lord will pick up one shoe and say, this was your best work. And he'll pick up another and say, this was not your best work. He said, I touch each shoe and labor with each shoe knowing I will see it again one day. Every haircut, ladies, you'll see it again. Fellas, every job you do, whether you're a construction worker, whether you're a tractor, you will see every job again at the judgment seat of Christ. So do your best work now for the glory of Christ, knowing you'll see it again. But there's a third word that I want to show you, and I want to show you how Adam's job was a defense for God. Look back at verse number 15 of chapter 2. Notice what it says. The Bible says, And God took the man and He put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to do what? Keep it. That word keep right there, it's the Hebrew word shamar. S-H-A-M-A-R, shamar. Every time that word is used in the Bible, it's used of a watchman that watches for invaders. God told Adam, he said, Now Adam, till the ground. Keep one eye on me and worship me. And keep one eye looking out for invaders in the garden. Lord, you do know there's no sin in the garden when God tells him that, right? What am I watching out for, God? It's not what he was watching out for. It was who he was to be watching out for. Because in a few verses, his wife is going to be at a tree. What's a gardener supposed to be working around? A tree. But he wasn't there. And the serpent comes and tempts Eve and mankind falls. And when God comes in the garden, who does he hold responsible? Adam. Why? Because God put him in the garden to be a watchman for the devil. Can I tell you why God put you at Honda Jet? You are there to be salt and light to keep the demons and devils of hell out of that little patch of grass. Let me tell you why God put you where He put you. Because you are to be the salt and light in that little patch of grass. 
You see, every time that somebody comes by and they look at you or they look at me and they tell a dirty joke, do you want me to tell you why we don't dirt join in in the dirty jokes at work? And we don't join in when they start cussing our God? And we don't join in when they start talking like filthy animals? And we don't join in because God has put us in that place to be salt and to be light and to keep the devil out of the little patch of grass that God's put us in. Now watch this. I can tell some of y'all are eating a fire out of this one. Well, it's blessing me. I know right now, I can read your mind. Oh, I can read your minds. Some of you are saying, now look, preacher, we don't work at a church like you work at a church. We work around heathens. And if I stand up and say no to that stuff, they're going to talk about me. Can I help you with something? They're already talking about you. Because the day that you claim the name of Christ, if you join in in their jokes, you know what they're talking about? They're saying you're a hypocrite. So if you don't want people to talk about you, then don't tell them you got saved. Because the day you told them you got saved and you still join in their dirty jokes behind your back, they're calling you a hypocrite. You say, but I, what will they say if, 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 I, if I tell them no? They'll call you a holy roller. I'd rather be a holy roller than a hypocrite any day. Because if I'm saved, I'm supposed to be holy. And if I roll in, I'm going somewhere. And I know I'm headed somewhere. I'd rather be a holy roller any day of the week than I would be to be called a hypocrite any day of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, every man in this room is a son of God. If you've been saved, therefore God expects you to be a man of God. It's time to man up. It's time for us to start acting like it. It's time for us to start doing what God's called us to do. And it's time for us to be the men God's called us to be. Listen, we got too many cupcake believers running around this world right now. I don't need cupcake believers in here. I want men that will stand. And when they fall, they'll stand back up. I'm not looking for perfect men. I'm looking for men that God is perfecting. There's a big difference. You know, I feel bad for young preachers. You know why? Because I used to be one. And I know how rough it can be. I just, nobody respects you. They, they call you pal. They call you butt. They just, nobody, res- and I want, man, I want to be the man of God. I want to be the one that everybody looked to. I want, I want to be that guy, but nobody thought of me like that. I work for Preacher Lemons. God bless his soul. He called me one day. He said, hey, son, you want to come work for me? He said, I'm going to give you part-time pay with full-time hours. I couldn't figure out what he was saying, so I said, sure, I'll take it. I'd love to do it. And man, I, I, showed, up in, I showed up that first day. I had three suits. And I showed up. Now I only got three suits that fit. But anyways, I showed up in, I showed up in that suit, and I just knew I was going to go into the preacher's study and I was going to stud. I just knew on Sunday I was going to stand up with that thing in my pocket. Three hairs on my chin. And I was going to be the man. Just like him. I showed up on that first day. And you know what he told me? Tyler! Go move him two liter drinks they just delivered to the church. Okay, I went, I had dirt up that side, I had, went back in, I said, I got them, preacher. Now, are you ready to study? He said, go move him boxes. Move him stupid boxes. I went home and honest, I looked like I'd been to war. <laughs> dirt up this side, dirt all over, I just looked. Next day I showed up, he said, go take my car to the car wash and get my car washed. He, he used to say crazy stuff. He'd say, now I don't like the way the bristles do at that one car wash. Go to the place where you hand wash it. <laughs> I worked for him for eight years doing this. Eight years. Eight, listen, eight years. By the time I got done, you know what I wanted to bristle? <laughs> 
I wanted to take him bristling mops at the streetcars and shh, just, just, preacher, open up. <laughs> I will never forget. I can tell you where I was. I can tell you the car that I was driving of his. He was in a 2007 Grand Marquis Palm Beach edition. I was driving down, um, and it was a nicer car than I was ever going to drive as a young man. So I'll tell you what I used to do. I'd put my suit on, and I'd ride down the road just like it was my car. I'd ride down, and I'd see people go by, and I'd wave like I was a banker or something. Like, I don't even know what I was doing. I'd just ride down the way, just people would, I'd, I'd just go on. They, they'd pull, I mean, you know, uh, stupid. Just plum stupid. <laughs> One day he told me, he said, go get my car washed. I got a funeral to do today. I'd had it. I had had it. I said, I'm going to, I thought in my head, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm worth more than this. By this time I was married, had a baby. I said, I'm worth more than this. God's called me to preach. I'm done with this. I'm over it. Just riding down the way. And how many of you have ever felt when the Holy Ghost will drop kick you right in the spirit? You ever had that feeling? And the Holy Ghost, as clear as a bell, He said, I'll never use you until you're happy just washing His car. I was on Battleground Avenue where Lawndale splits off to the right, where it pulls around to the left at that where the train track used to be, where the stoplight is now. I'll never forget. I sat right there at the light. The light went green. I had a resolve in my soul. God dealt with my heart. I said, God, I will wash this car as if I'm preaching to thousands of people. I got out there, honey. I mean, I cut a jig. I was out in my suit. I got that thing. I said, oh, yeah. Thank-. And I mean, I just, I had, I had at it. I mean, I was, going, I was going, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. I mean, I was going, that will be on Twitter in, a, in, a, in an hour. <laughs> Son, I mean, I, I was out there. I had my tie. I t- honest, I took Windex. I took Windex in my vest, and I would buff. The car, because I knew the, the clothing I had was nicer than them old rags. I got in his car, so help me, I took my shoes off because I didn't want to get little pebbles in his car. Within one week of that day, God began to deal with me about going into evangelism. Within one week of that day. Here's why. Because God taught me how to glorify Him in the smallest job. And He started opening up bigger. You want me to tell you why I study like I... I don't study like I want to, but you want me to tell you why I study like I do? Because I'm going to tell you, I know one day I'm going to meet every message I ever preached again in front of the judgment seat. Ricky, you're going to see every horseshoe you ever made. We're going to see every pipe we've ever plumbed. We're going to see every nail we've ever driven. We're going to see every stock we ever traded. We're going to see every computer we ever fixed. We're going to see every Wi-Fi. We're going to see absolutely everything we've ever done. And God's going to go through it and say, You glorified me there. That wasn't your best work. That was good. That You didn't do that with the right motive. If we're going to be men of God, it flips. It doesn't start at home. It starts at work. Repeat after me, men. I am a son of God. Therefore, I must be a man of God.